Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Meadowbrook Congregational Church. My name is Pastor Joel Boyd, and I'm blessed to serve this congregation and all of its members and friends. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors joining us this morning in person and our friends joining us online. We're glad to have you with us today. Well, friends, our rummage sale is coming back this fall, as you may have heard. Uh, you can uh, look to your weekly email for uh, a bunch of details, but please note that we are actively looking for folks to sign up to help out. Uh, we'll be starting off with a, a uh, setup date on October 2nd. Uh, we'll have uh, some sorting throughout the week, and then we'll have our sale dates on Friday, October 7th, and Saturday, October 8th. So uh, look for a special sign-up to come up real soon and reach out to Bonnie Hyde uh, with any questions or to let her know that you're happy to help out. Well, friends, I invite everyone to go ahead and mark your calendars if you haven't already done so and plan to join us for our special Rally Sunday worship and Sunday school that we're going to be kicking off on September 11th at 10 a.m., always a special time of year in the life of our church. And friends, this year we have a very special occasion to celebrate. We'll be celebrating the payoff of our, of our uh, church building mortgage. At 11 a.m. following service, we'll have a special potluck fellowship, uh, music, outdoor games, and much more. Uh, so we welcome all volunteers to come on out and help us out. Uh, so go ahead, see your email to sign up either for the potluck or to help up with set up or clean up and feel free to reach out to Danny Reeves or myself if you'd like to be part of uh, the, the folks providing music that day. Well friends at this time I want to pass it over to uh, Danny Reeves our director of music for a special announcement. Danny. Morning everyone. So next week is August 28th and that is going to be our choir potluck that we're having right after service. So this is for all new and returning choir members or anyone who might be interested in uh, music making of any kind at our church. You are invited to come next Sunday after service. Uh, we're going to have it in the fellowship hall. So if you can, bring a dish to pass, and I'll see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, and to all the members and friends of our choir. Uh, friends, at this time, I have some rather sad news to announce. We have just recently learned that Joan Corville uh, of our church in uh, Bushnell uh, has passed uh, away peacefully to her rest. Uh, she had passed on August 18th in her home at the age of 94. Uh, for those who would like to learn more about uh, information for services for Joan, you may take a look at Thayer Rock funeral home that's on Grand River Avenue in Farmington. We pray for all of Joan's family and her friends. At this time, let us take a time to prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of our Lord. Please stand in body or spirit. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who, who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. Even the bread that makes you fail, for he is sweet to give you life.
Now join in this morning's invocation and the Lord's Prayer. We join our voices with the prayer of the psalmist who prays, the nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord will build up Zion. He will appear in his glory. Bless us, O God, by the assurance of knowing you are always with your people. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 58. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from tampering, trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day. If you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
sisters and brothers, friends, let us now take a time to raise those prayers of our innermost hearts to the Lord as we pray now in a moment of silence. Sustaining God. Lord, you pick us up when we are down. You give us hope when times are hard, when they're challenging. And Lord, you bless your people through all seasons in life. And you give us the strength of heart for the task of being your people. Bless us, Lord, and hear all of our prayers. Lord, we pray for the friends and family of Joan Corville as she has made her journey to you on August 18th. We ask that you bless all those who remember her in love. Lord, we continue to pray for Deb Hirschfield as she recovers from a recent kidney stone procedure. And Lord, we pray for Ellis Tucker, grandfather of Joshua Tucker, as he continues to recover from a recent hip replacement surgery. And Lord, we give you thanks that his surgery is, uh, his treatment is going uh, really well and that he has been in good spirits. Lord, we continue to pray for Steve Pearson as he recovers following a recent knee procedure. We pray for Judy Gress as she continues on in her cancer treatment. We pray for Amanda McKenzie, Colleen Foster's sister-in-law, as she has been diagnosed with breast cancer. She is now recovering uh, from a surgery, Lord, that took place on August 16th. We pray for Bob Smith as he continues his battle with prostate cancer. We pray for Peggy Wright and family as they Mourn the passing of Peggy's mother, Jo. And we pray for Marlene Kuntz of Northville Civic Concern as she mourns the passing of her son. Lord, we continue to pray for all those impacted by the flooding in Kentucky these past few weeks. We pray for all your people impacted by recent variants in the COVID-19 pandemic. Lord, we ask that you bless your people in Ukraine, that you be with them and uh, keep them safe, uh, help guide them, and help there be greater understanding that the war there may come to a speedy end. Lord, this week we celebrate the coming birthdays of Marilyn Worth and Michelle Fecht and Tim Barnes of our church. We wish them a happy birthday and give you thanks for them. Lord, we raise all these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Friends, the offering for the work of this church will now be received.
Let us pray. Loving, giving God, Lord, all that we have comes from you. Lord, we ask that you bless these, our gifts, that they may be used to further your kingdom here on earth to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Well, now may the Lord God open our hearts and minds as we witness to the word in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words into your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow to build, and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For countless years, God has called on people of faith to live out the divine charge on their life. We see this, of course, stretching all the way back in the Bible. And we also see it today. In Genesis 12, we see that God called on Abram, not yet known as Abraham, to leave his home and to go to the land God was to show him. In Exodus 4, God called to Moses, from the burning bush and charged him with the task of leading the enslaved people of Israel out of Egypt. In Jonah 1, God called the prophet Jonah to prophesy to the people of Nineveh. In Luke 2, God's angel Gabriel calls on the Virgin Mary to give birth and be mother to the Son of God who she would name Jesus, just as the angel had said. In Acts 8, an angel of the Lord calls the apostle Philip to head south on a wilderness road, which leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. And Philip encounters an Ethiopian eunuch, reading aloud from Isaiah. The Holy Spirit calls Philip to engage the Ethiopian, and he soon teaches about the connection of the prophecy of Isaiah to Jesus, following which the Ethiopian asked to be and is baptized by Philip. In Acts 9, the risen and ascended Jesus appeared to Saul when he was still persecuting the church and before he was known as Paul. And Jesus both confronted and called Saul, telling him that he must go to the city where he will be told what to do next. 
Abram and Sarai would go on to serve as Abraham and Sarah, God's devoted keepers of the covenant and parents to an amazing lineage of leaders in the faith. God called them and provided for them and for their descendants. Moses would at first express some doubt about his fitness for the unbelievably difficult job of leading the Israelites to freedom, citing his unease about speaking as a leader. Yet God provided for Moses through the gifts of his own brother, Aaron, and was at work through the liberation of the Israelites from their bondage. While Jonah tried to run away from a challenging call, God provided and worked through the prophet, turning many Ninevite hearts toward the love of God, perhaps even despite Jonah's resistance. God's angel Gabriel encouraged the young unmarried Mary, but amazingly, she didn't appear to need much encouragement. For she professed her devotion to God in living out her call and the Gospels and Book of Acts show she did so throughout all of her life even. Even after losing her own cherished son. God provided and was present in her great strength and in her witness. God worked through an angel and the spirit in establishing what today we'd call a cross-cultural connection between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. God worked through God's scripture in the heart of the Ethiopian, who was moved by Philip's testimony and sought to be baptized as a follower of Jesus. And following this, Philip is somehow transported by the Holy Spirit, almost as if he's teleported away, leaving the newly baptized Christian rejoicing. And then we have Saul. Note not Saul, the first king of Israel in the Hebrew Bible, but the Saul who would become the Apostle Paul of the New Testament. We always need to remind ourselves that Saul, this Saul, was actually persecuting the earliest church before his conversion. Granted, he no doubt felt he was acting righteously according to the law of Moses, which he was following. But Acts shows us an amazing thing as we witness that it was the resurrected and ascended Jesus who appeared to Saul. Saul, literally seeing the light, fell down. God the Father provided through the Son and the heart of Saul was changed from persecutor of the faith to proclaimer and teacher of the faith in Christ. It's also worth noting how God provided through Paul in blessing many churches even into their existence and in writing much of the New Testament scriptures by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, these are only some of the many examples we could identify of how God is present in and provides for and through God's people, even people we don't expect, even people who don't expect it themselves. We should highlight how God works through all kinds of people, right? All kinds of people. God provides for and through women. Children, men, people of different understandings of gender even, the young and the old, people of different races and cultures, certainly, people within the faith family, the immediate faith family, as well as those not yet inside it, or who have recently been considered on the outside, maybe even enemies. It includes even the powerful and the disenfranchised. God provides through any and all that God so desires. In other words, God is not limited in achieving God's plans. Yet it's interesting to point out that God doesn't necessarily call 
those people who are ready <laughs> all the time. They're not necessarily ready or prepared or those who have special experience or even a highlighted talent for the task at hand specifically. As many have witnessed, God does not call the equipped. Rather, God equips the call. But that may not be all that clear to us when we're discerning our next steps in faith on a day-to-day basis. Take Jeremiah, our passage from this morning. There we meet the young Jeremiah, at the very beginning of this book of prophecy. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. You might think, wow, that's some serious stuff to hear right off the bat. Just imagine yourself hearing something along these lines at this age. How would you reply at first? Well, Jeremiah is a bit overwhelmed, right? He says, ah, Lord God, truly, I did not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. In a way, at the start here, in a way, Jeremiah tries to downplay the whole deal. He tries a little bit. He cites his youth as a bit of an excuse for his not really being up to the task. It's like he's trying to bow out, you know, of something he doesn't really want to get into, you know, kind of thanks, but no thanks type of thing. Or maybe not. Maybe he's just trying to process the information quickly. And this is the best he's got to say back. And he doesn't really get that far. He doesn't have much time to think about it, right? Because God continues saying, do not say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. God doesn't leave a whole lot of room for the young Jeremiah to object, does he? (laughs) it's not like he can say he's too busy or has a conflict on that night or or try to schedule a, a Zoom meeting, you know, to explore the idea next month or so. No, God actually provides even during God's own reply. God removes the concern about age and or experience and rather than to leave him hanging out there high and dry, God tells Jeremiah that God will be with the young prophet. Yeah, he's going to go wherever and say whatever God asks him to, but God will be with Jeremiah the whole time. Do not be afraid, God tells Jeremiah. And not only will God be present, but God will deliver him. God will provide. What does it feel like to be given a big responsibility? How do we sometimes try to get out of it? What happens when we live up to it and and just own it, jump in? Sometimes we're totally confident that we got it, we got this. We feel up to the job. Maybe we've had experience doing this kind of thing before or It just seems kind of natural, intuitive to us. So we don't have as many hang-ups on agreeing to go forward with it. But other times, this can be really difficult, right? We may be worried that we are not really qualified or that others, they just have more natural talent to do this thing in this particular area. Perhaps we're swamped. And just feel that we don't have the time to commit to anything additional at the moment. Maybe that's the way we feel our entire lives. Or we might just be afraid. We might fear failure. 
embarrassment, judgment, or possibly even punishment or more serious repercussions yet should the whole thing go south or maybe even be a direct challenge to authority and to power. And you know what? These concerns all make sense, don't they? Just as do the ones we hear from different people in the Bible. Sometimes we're a bit shocked, overwhelmed, that they just have to follow through with this, some of these tasks <laughs> that they have. We might even wonder what, what God was up to. Why, why did God put them all through these certain tasks they had to do? Well, now, at this point, you'll have to forgive me because I'm not an expert gardener, okay? No doubt, and I know there are some expert gardeners with us today who could speak a lot more to uh, what goes on in appropriately preparing soil and planting seeds in a way that they'll really flourish or moving plants, flowers, caring for them, maximizing their beauty and expertise. Well, I'd like to simply talk about what God says to Jeremiah about his job to do here at the start of what this might speak into the ways we are called to be planters ourselves of various kinds in our own lives, probably as individuals, but also as the people of God, the church together. Jeremiah continues in our passage this morning, sharing, Then the Lord put his hand out and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is an especially cool passage in the way that it depicts God placing the word in the mouth of the prophet. It was some, something we feel like we could visualize, probably would if we had some sci-fi movie about this today, right? Now, scholars often refer to prophets as being the mouthpieces of God. If you look into this in the, the Hebrew Bible, the mouthpieces of God, not to suggest necessarily that they have no freedom to say things or that they have no agency, right? They're not like a machine or a puppet, but that they are in direct relationship with God. The book of Jeremiah is the largest book of prophecy in the entire Bible. So if you want to do something huge, you can start a Bible study on that one. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it with you. The largest one of prophecy. Now, all kinds of amazing and very tragic things, actually, take place in its verses. Jeremiah himself served as a prophet from the time of the, you know, supposedly known as good king, Josiah, right, who was the boy king, we see, especially in some of our children's Bibles, right? The boy king, well, he grows up and he's one of the good ki kings, trying to get things back on track. But then Jeremiah has to continue on as a prophet for the next four kings of Judah. When the whole region would be mired in war and destruction, Jeremiah is often considered the weeping prophet. It's kind of tough. He didn't have an easy time. But some suggest that given the rejection of God's word by so many people during this time, that Jeremiah might actually be more accurately understood as the persecuted prophet. Jeremiah would go on to prophesy relentlessly for the hearts of people to change, uh, for them to praise God and, and not actual idols, physical idols. But they persisted in this brokenness in, and, and, and fell in time, right? Israel, at this time, there would be two kingdoms of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. 
Israel would fall to its neighbor Assyria and Judah to its neighbor Egypt. But in time, they'd all fall to Babylon. Despite all Jeremiah tried to prophesy. But here at the start, we see how God assures Jeremiah that God will be with him. And God gives him a job to do. Jeremiah is charged to actively engage in the world around him, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. That's some big stuff to do. <laughs> How much of this would one person actually be able to achieve, we might wonder? Just how overwhelming would this have been for Jeremiah to witness to? Nevertheless, this was God's charge to the prophet. While the pulling down and this destroying bit may sound harsh, uh, yet a tad clearer, we can kind of understand that what, that, what that might look like. Get rid of false practices, right? And, and, and systems that may be deemed unfaithful to God. Uh, you may understand that a little more in your mind anyway. The building and the planting on the positive, well, that could be maybe a bit more challenging even just to grasp what that is, let alone to achieve it. Even if you can determine what to dismantle and get broad enough support to do so, you still have to plan what actually should be built and adopted in its place, right? You ever notice how easy it can be to criticize something without having even a shred of a helpful thing to suggest in its place? Ever know anybody like that? I had a great friend back in college. Um, and she would always denounce our plans and say, that's a terrible idea. We can't go there. A place is no fun. I'd say, well, what do you want to do? I'd say, I don't have a better idea. <laughs> she said, just because I don't have a better idea doesn't make your idea any less bad. So that's an interesting point. Not that helpful. So it can be hard to discern where you need to go, what is a faithful challenge to address, and then what to do on the other side of this. Or how do you love into that? that new change. Well, Jeremiah descended from a family of priests and was called to proclaim God's sovereignty to, uh, to a world, right, in his mind probably, a world, bent on praising the idols that they liked. That's what they did. They worshipped Baal. They wanted to do these things. You know, one king would do one thing, it would flip, and, and he'd have to address it. So... He had an extremely difficult time of it and would witness the great downfall of his own people. Can you imagine how hard and how heartbreaking that would be? And yet, Jeremiah's prophecy would come true. That's why we celebrate him as a prophet. God's word did come to fruition. We might wonder what it was that Jeremiah was hoping to build. What could have happened? What actually could have happened? What, what he aimed to plant on the other side of the pulling down. And yet the truth that we stand today as a church, as many, many faith communities influenced here, it speaks into the seeds that this tragic prophet planted. And of course, the people of Israel would return to faithfulness in time. Absolutely, we see this happen. Just as we see challenges faced time again and write it again. And <laughs> we see a lot of this in the scripture. And yet Jeremiah did not live to see the seeds of faith he planted grow into all that they've been blessed to be. He didn't live to see all. But Jeremiah planted them anyway, because the glory was God's, not his. Sisters and brothers, we ask ourselves, what seeds of faith, 
what seeds of faith might we be called to plant in our relationships, in our homes, our schools, our careers? Uh, and, and what might we be called to address together as a church, or as the church? What unjust systems might need to be pulled down or, or pulled out by the roots, right? And what kind of gentle encouragement, what kind of love might need to be planted in the hearts of God's people? Friends, may we listen closely to the call of the Spirit for the ways we may make the most of what we've been given and plant the seeds of faith that will bloom tomorrow. May it be so, to the glory of God. Amen. Well, friends, please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our sending hymn, number 578, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. Writing to the church in Rome, the Apostle Paul encourages the church to unity when he writes, Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Indeed, friends, may we welcome one another and all God's people to the glory of God's holy name. And now, may the Lord God bless you, keep you, and fill your heart with hope for the task of living the gospel, of sharing God's love through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.